Good morning. It is such a pleasure to be continuing on the follow journey, not only here, but all the way across the Eastern Regional Conference. We have over 30 different churches, about 1,600 people uh, plus engaged in the follow journey together. Uh, so hopefully as you've started this week and you've gotten into some of the devotionals, you've experienced what we, what we talked about last week as far as hearing the voice of God. And, and maybe you're still wrestling through with how, how do I do that? And, and you're discovering pieces. Maybe you're at the deep end of the pool and maybe, maybe you've just been you know, journaling and journaling and journaling. Um, I've had a couple people tell me there's not enough space. <laughs> I keep wanting to write uh, and have more space for the, the questions as I'm reflecting on the passage. Uh, so whether you're writing books as a result of the question or you're just writing a couple of like simple one-word answers, that is, we're trusting that that's the Holy Spirit working in and through God's Word to speak to you. Uh, and so we're going to move a little bit this week from, okay, now we've started to hear God's voice, or as we begin to hear God's voice, what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Because our nature is to say, thanks God for talking to me, for me. Remember, we ended last week and we said, you know, a lot of times in the church, we end up with this, this focus where we say, I got to pray more, I got to read more, and I got to go to church more. And we feel like that's how we get close to God. And, and we said, those things are important. They are very important, because how do you know how someone speaks unless you, you've, you've heard what they've said before? And, and how do you know what it's like to be, see God move among a people unless you're in community? And how do you actually pause long enough to let God lead you if you're not willing to have a conversation with him. Like those things are important, but if the focus is on us and how well we do those to try and get to God, we've made things that are part of the relationship into a tool or, a, or work that we try to use to get to the relationship, and it's not that way. Instead, we should be thinking, God, how am I experiencing your goodness right now? How, how am I and those around me experiencing your love right now? And, and what, are you, what are you leading me to do? How am you leading me to be in this place, in this time? That's kind of where we were last week. And, and this week, we're going to turn the corner a little bit and say, okay, if we're, if we're living according to these things, what does, Jesus, what does Jesus call us to do as a result? Like after we hear him, after we understand what he's saying, what do we do? So would you join me in, in prayer just for a moment? And uh, we're going to, again, we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. Uh, and remember, I said last week, this is, this is a prayer of surrender. We already know the Holy Spirit's here. So we're not like suddenly poof, he appears. <laughs> He's already here, but we don't always allow him to move in the same way that, that, that he would like to. Uh, so we're just going to pray a prayer of surrender, invite him to lead our time. Holy Spirit, come. We invite you beyond our expectations, beyond our short-sightedness, beyond how we feel. But Lord, you would, you would surround us with your presence through the Holy Spirit. And we would be in a place where we're not hidden from you, we're not hiding from you, we can't. But as we honestly take a look in the mirror with you, that you would embrace us in such a way that all of the faults and all of the things that we felt shame about and all of the things that have been broken, those things would be transformed into the likeness of you. Thank you, God, that you're willing to do that. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your work in weaving those things together, and weaving the life of God and the unique design that we have together empowering us to be like Jesus. Help us to hear you today and understand where you're taking us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going we're gonna to just take a short look at Matthew 7. This will feel a little bit like, for those of you who have already been doing the journal this week, this will feel a little bit like another, another journal entry, but we'll be doing it together. Um, so, Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 24. Now, this Matthew chapter 7 is one where Jesus does, he's doing like several teachings. And 
Last week we talked about, you know, he does, he'll, he wants us to get it. And so often he'll put a, a word picture there that for us to be able to see it and see what we hear, to be able to grasp onto it so we know how to live it. And so he has a series of teachings so he's on judging and asking and, and how, we, you know, how we get to heaven. You know, it's not the, it's not the, the wide gate, it's the narrow and, and a tree and its fruit. And so all these really visual, highly visual, very specific pictures. And then we come to one that, that some of us have probably heard before. But there's a, connection, there's a connection to the land and the place where Jesus is when he tells this story that because we don't live there, it's a little hard for us to imagine. So we want to just experience that one together and, and see those pictures together today and, and see what God does with that. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. If you look at it, uh, just that first verse, Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And I want to pause right there. Because Jesus says a whole lot in one sentence. That's so Jesus. And he says a whole lot, and it's just one sentence. But he says, everyone who hears, and we talked last week, you know, we've got to be able to see what we hear. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Now, the word for puts it into practice, sometimes it'll say, um, you know, whoever does these things, whoever works out these things. The word simply means do. But if there's a Greek word that he uses there, and it's, it's uh, po- poiai or poie, and it comes from the root Poieo, or poema. And those of you who've been with us for a while, you've, you've heard me teach before on the word poema. It's where we get our word poem. And so that Greek word for poem, when you put it into the active sense, where it's not just you're talking about a creative, so, so let's pause for a minute and think about what a poem is. A poem is a construction of words meant to have an emotional and a picture effect so that when you read it, you experience something that the author of that poem wants you to experience in the, in the fewest words possible. And so they'll arrange the words and they just play with the words till it becomes a picture. Haiku is a great example of that where it's like, I mean, you only have so many words, but by the time you're done with it, so much has been said. And that word poema is used when God talks about us in Ephesians 2.10, that we are God's workmanship. It's the word poema. We're his poem. We're his song. We're, we've been knit together in a way that the very way that we live and the very presence that we have is meant to be this explosive picture that says so much. Isn't it amazing God thinks of us that way? And so often we think so much less of ourselves. Well, when Jesus picks that word up here, obviously it's long before Paul picks the word up later. But when Jesus uses the word here, he, he's looking at the same thing. Anyone who hears these words of mine and becomes a performer of them. Anyone who gets the poem and is willing to, with their own poem, their own song, live it out. That's the idea. Maybe that doesn't connect to you. Maybe you're not an English like person. Maybe you don't care about poetry or songs. But let me put it in a, in a, in a sports frame. So anybody who, who hears the training and hears how they should do it and deliberately goes into practicing it, deliberately develops skills so that they can perform really well at it. So they become an elite athlete. Jesus says anybody who does that is like a person who built their house upon the rock. Part of hearing God's word and listening for God's word is designed for us to understand the potential he's revealing. Okay, that's why we spent so much time last week looking at saying, look at what you hear. When God says something, there's potential there. There's power there. There's something he's trying to unpack. And in order to discover that potential, in order to realize that potential, The first thing Jesus says is it it takes some training. It takes some training. Realizing that potential takes training. And just let that land for a second because if you realize potential, that means that that 
potential that was unknown before or, or maybe seen from a distance, but not in reality. It was just, it was just understood. You, could, you sort of caught a glimpse of it, but it hasn't actually happened. There's a process to help it come into reality. That's realized potential. It takes training. But again, this is not the kind of training that we often put ourselves through where we, we line up all of these tasks that we have to do. Jesus says, no, no, it's not that. It's simply responding and engaging with what I've told you, with what I've shared with you, so that you begin to have it become a part of your life. You keep practicing it. Well, what's the one thing we know about practice? What's that? Well, practice, max, practice actually makes proficient. It doesn't always make perfect. <laughs> it may, because we'll often repeat, like if we, if we practice wrong, we'll, we'll, perf, we'll, we'll get really good at something, we'll get really proficient at something, but it may not be the right thing. So, so you're, you're almost right in that. But, but practice, if practice doesn't automatically lead to success, does it? What happens in practice that we're normally not okay with? Mistakes. Failure. That's why we practice. That's one of the reasons why we have a hard time with people saying medical practice. Like we, we don't want our doctors practicing on us. But there's a reality to that, that, that something as complicated as the human design, you're never done learning. And that's why it's called medical practice. It's not because they want to make mistakes. It's not because doctors intend to make mistakes. It's just there's so much complexity of the human design. It takes this constant learning, this constant state of learning. But to be in a constant state of learning, you have to be okay with mistakes. So sometimes when we hear Jesus say, put this into practice, we get in our minds like, okay, he said that, ah, oh, I didn't live up to it, I must be going to hell. I mean, it's just this, the minute we don't live up to it, we're like, ah, oh. instead of recognizing, no, we're, we're practicing. We're putting it into practice. We're, we're putting ourselves in a position where we're learning how to walk this way with Jesus. And if we're willing to do that, and we understand that so much of that depends on his empowerment through the Holy Spirit, so much of that depends on his empowerment. Yes, there's the focus on our part. Yes, there's the ability to say, I'm not going to be distracted, that I really want to keep my eyes fixed on you. But the rest of that, remember, the growth comes from God. So we put ourselves in that place of practice, and it's okay to have mistakes. As a matter of fact, God knows the mistakes we're going to have before we have them, and he says, yeah, I'm just waiting because that's going to be a teachable moment. Remember what we said last week, that we're willing to hear it and see it. He's like, yes, let me give you more. So if we're willing to put it into practice, that, that potential will be realized. Not because we're so good at it, but because as we're willing to, to muck into it and, and, and jump in and, and, and make mistakes, but we're trusting God, he says, yeah, yeah, we're going we're gonna to bring this potential out of you. I would say for everybody in this room, we probably have a story of a point in our life where we didn't believe we could do something. And the first time we tried it, it, it may have been a success, it may have been a disaster, but it ends up being something that we enjoy doing because we kept at it. Or maybe somebody came alongside of us and believed in us and said, no, you know, you can do this. And for those of us who haven't had that experience, we're longing for that. Guess what? That's what Jesus wants to do with you. He wants to be able to walk alongside him and be like, yeah, you can do this. You can do this. Just be willing to put my words into practice. So realized potential requires training. And then Jesus goes into a picture because he wants to unpack this. He wants us to, to get the picture of what he's talking about. He says, the rains fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against that house, meaning the house that was built on the rock, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Okay, well, so far we're tracking, right? Build a house on the rock. It's going to be away from trouble. We're able to stand. And he says this, everyone who hears these words of mine 
and does not act on them, does not put them into practice, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and they slammed against that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. That brings us to our second point that Jesus wants us to get, but I'm going to unpack this a little bit. The, the, the realized potential not only requires practice, it also requires wisdom. Remember we said last week, we, we listen to the voice of God because God always sees things way better than we do. He always sees it from a perspective that we can't. That there's understanding that comes if we'll listen to Him. And so Jesus is, is going right down that path and He's saying, not only do we need to put Him into practice, we need to tune in to what his words are saying. And, and, and the reason is because if we don't, we're putting ourselves in jeopardy. But there's a piece of this picture we may not understand. See, where, if you've ever been to the land of Israel, which you know, many of us haven't, I, I happen to have been able to go when I was in college. And what's amazing about Israel is there's so many land geographies. So those of you who are geography buffs, like Israel is a, is a wonder in the world because there's so many different geographies all in this little, you know, so many square miles, a couple hundred square miles, you know, and it's, it's all this geography. You've got coastal plains, you've got mountains with ice caps on them, you've got mountains that are sort of fertile land, you've got farmland, and then you've got desert all in this one small country. And at the north, where Mount Hermon is, which is the mountain that typically has ice caps on it, those ice caps seasonally, they'll melt, and, and spring water comes down from the mountains, and it'll go into these underground, so some of it feeds the Jordan River, and some of it feeds into underground caverns and streams, and they come out towards the desert as oases. You know, so you have these little streams that just come out in the middle of the desert. It's rock and, and dirt and dust everywhere, and there's... All of a sudden, there's water, and there's growth, there's greenery. And other parts, whereas the mountain ridge comes down through Israel towards the desert, storms will come up along the coastline, and rains will come up along there and across the Sea of Galilee, and they'll hit the mountains that run up the spine of the country. And when those rains hit, they'll run down the mountains. And as they run down the mountains, they hit that dry, rocky land as it goes towards the Dead Sea in the desert. And that water will carve out massive cracks in the rock that become valleys. Those valleys are called wadis. And wadis are pretty amazing. I mean, I had a chance to walk down the Wadi Kelt, uh, which goes down, from, uh, it goes down from up towards Jerusalem. It goes down towards um, Jericho. When you come to the Wadi Kelt, you're, you're like, and you're in the Wadi Kelt, there's a monastery that's actually carved into the side of the, of the rock, but the, 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 the depth of that um, valley goes down like 100 feet or more. And you're, so you're walking on these narrow ledges that are only wide enough for a person or a donkey. And while you're walking them, you know, little shepherd girls and boys will be bringing sheep and donkeys through. And so you're, you're kind of like pressed up against the rock of the wall because if you fall, there's no, there's no guardrail, there's no handrail, there's no rope. You're, you're going for a slide, and it's not going to be fun. So we're walking down through there, and you go through all this dry, rocky, dusty, arid area, and as we come to the end of the wadi, this long, winding crevice in through the rock, it starts to flatten out, and as it opens up, there's Jericho, and it's this fertile, greenery, fruits, vegetables. There's a, whole, there's a whole city there. It's beautiful. In the middle, I mean, I never understood what an oasis was until I had that experience. I never understood what a wadi was until I had that experience. And you begin to understand that wadis, wadis can get so wide because they have regular river, like the regular waters go through there it can actually look really good. So here's a picture of a wadi. That is, as you come towards the end of a wadi, you can see how the hills are kind of coming down from the sides and it's sort of, sort of opening up. But you understand the Dead Sea is way below sea level. 
And so all that water from up on the mountains is constantly carving itself down or carving down through the rock. And, and when it does, in the middle of those wadis are all the minerals that have been eroded out of the rocks. And it leaves this really fine silica sand at the bottom of wadi. Now look at that picture. If you didn't know that that was a wadi, if you didn't know that water had carved that, you might look at that and be like, man, this is amazing. I mean, sand, those of you who've done construction or building, sand isn't a bad thing. It's easily packed. It, it drains well. And you can use it for building quite well if you wanted to build a house there. You might, you might sit there and go, this would be an amazing view. Can you imagine being surrounded by these mountains and then just looking out and you see this entire valley? And just waking up to that every morning. And you're like, wow. Wow, that's so cool. I want to build a house right here. Well, if you didn't know what a wadi was, you might be tempted to do that. But now that I've told you what a wadi is, let me show you what a wadi does. I want you to watch this for just a moment. And this is, this is a picture of what happens. So when, when storms or rain happen along the mountain ridge, you may never see a cloud in the desert. You may not see a single cloud in the sky. It could be partly cloudy and, and blue skies and, and sunny, and you never see a thing. But standing there in the middle of the wadi, all of a sudden, you'll experience this. See, like initially you're looking at it and they're like, oh yeah, it's just a little water. <laughs> but within minutes, that was only two minutes. Two minutes for it to go from up around the bend to becoming a full-on raging river as a result of floodwaters coming down from the mountains. Again, if you didn't know that was a wadi and you thought that was an ideal place to build, just recently, Petra, uh, which if you've ever seen Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, when they go into the temple at the end, that's actually Petra in Jordan. Uh, and I was there, and, and, and it's, it's this, you, you don't think about it being a wadi because it's a major tourist area. And so buses pull up, they got parking areas everywhere, and you walk down through this narrow 
trail through this rock face and you come out just like at the end when they ride out on the horses. That's, they're going out the wadi. It's a wadi. And you don't think about that. You even see like on the edges where they had channels they built in so that, that water could come down and they could fill their cisterns down there in the city. They just had a historic rainfall. And it, I mean, it's been like a once in a generation kind of thing where flooding came down through the Wadi of Petra. People died. Property was damaged. All of a sudden. That's the image that Jesus is giving when he says this. Those who hear his words and, they, and we don't practice, we don't put them into practice. He says, you're building your house in a Wadi. It looks good, but at a time when you don't expect, on a cloudless day, there's something that's going to come and sweep it away. Why? Because you've built it on principles without wisdom, without understanding. We would all sit here after seeing that and go, yeah, what fool would put his house in the middle of a, of a dry riverbed that any time it rains... Up north, it could come right through here. You don't do it. But if you didn't know any better and you didn't listen to the wisdom and understanding that others were sharing with you about what a wadi is, you might think you've got the greatest location, the greatest real estate. And you might be able to live there for quite a, quite a few years. But at some point, the reality of what a wadi is will override whatever experience you've had and whatever knowledge you thought you had. This is why Jesus says, whoever has what they think, and you know, it's, who, who only has, but they're not really listening to him, whatever they have will be taken from them. Or whoever, you know, whoever does not have. In other words, you're not taking in the wisdom. But whoever has, whoever's willing to listen to the wisdom, more will be given. It's simple when we look at this. We go, wow. Yeah, if I know it's a wadi, I'm not going to build my house there. And so I'm probably not going to have to deal with a flood. Realized potential requires wisdom. We cannot fully realize the potential of what God is calling us to if we're not willing to listen to his wisdom and his understanding. And Jesus just gives us a real simple picture for that. And then he goes one step further. If you look at the rest of that passage, uh, and it's actually, these are not the words of Jesus. This is the, re the reaction to Jesus. I just want us to look at this for a second. When Jesus finished saying these things and giving this picture, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one that had authority and not as their scholars. That was a whole other thing as far as like understanding what authority meant in Scripture and so on. But I just want to, I want to take the simplest definition, the simplest thing that we all understand. If somebody's an authority on something, it means they know something about what they're talking about, right? Or if somebody has authority, that means that they've been given the responsibility and the power to be able to take action in a particular direction. So they're amazed because Jesus is standing there teaching as one who's been given this authority. So ask yourself why. He's unpacking things with the wisdom and the understanding of the Father who sees everything. And they're sitting there going, whoa. And as he unpacks that story, we're challenged because in order to realize potential with our training, we have to be willing to live our life connected to his wisdom and his understanding as if we're an artist who's playing a song from, the, from our soul. Not playing a song technically, okay, I got all the notes down, but playing it from our soul. As an athlete who's training in order to be an Olympian, not somebody who's just like, hey, I play in a rec league. You know, it's, 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 you're doing it with all of your strength and all of your might because the very expression of who you are and your design is coming out. And that wisdom and that understanding is being lived out. And we let that wisdom and understanding guide how we're training and how the decisions we're making so that we don't wind up in a wadi. But the last piece of it is, is as we walk with Jesus, his authority begins to operate in and through what he's teaching us. 
So as I listen to the voice of God, as you listen to the voice of God, as, as we collectively listen to the voice of God, the authority of God, the kingdom of God begins to be established in how we are living because we are putting it into practice, because we are making decisions by his wisdom and his understanding. And so what we're doing together is founded on rock. And if you haven't made the connection already, <laughs> Jesus is that rock. He's that rock. And I want to go back to that picture of the wadi for just a second, because if somebody has authority to speak into a situation, our tendency is going to be to do what? If they're speaking and they have authority, what are we going to do? We're going to listen, right? Because they might know something about it. If you're standing in a wadi and you're willing to listen and somebody is standing on a rock at the top of that ridge and they say, hey, you're in a wadi. And you go, what's a wadi? It's a floodplain. Oh, you might want to get out. It's raining up north. Do you know that if your life is walking with Jesus, you're hearing him, you're living according to his wisdom and understanding, if your life is built on that rock, you have a responsibility as those who are operating in his authority to be able to say to others, you're in a wadi. Let me give you a hand. It's not because I'm smart, because I have wisdom. Let me introduce you to one who taught me about wadis. So you'll make that mistake again. See, we become able to join Jesus. It's not just learning from him, it's joining him in the mission so that we can help others hear the voice of God. We can help them gain wisdom and understanding directly from God. And Jesus can be the one to be like, hey, you're in a wadi, you need to get out. Because you don't see it right now, and it's bright and sunny and shiny, and it looks beautiful, but I'm telling you, there's rain coming, and if you build your house here, it's going to fall. And how do I know Jesus would say something like that? Because he did. He did. Simple picture. Realized potential requires adjustment. It requires adjustment. It requires that we adjust to the wisdom and understanding that we've gotten, but it also requires that we adjust our priorities. We adjust our focus daily to be able to say, how do I share that? How do I share that? See, as God reveals more of himself and his plans, and we make him the, 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 the foundation, he's showing us this potential that he sees in us and in those around us. He's showing us that potential constantly. We need to then be willing to adjust our priorities. And as we live fully into that potential in us that he sees, we'll begin to see the potential in others. And then he'll be like, hey, you want to give me a hand? We need a human rope to get these people out of a wadi. I'll give you one last picture of this. Because this, again, is just a very simple look at something Jesus shared. But it's taking the listening to, to God, hearing his voice, and putting it into practice. If we're willing to listen, it may not be every day. It may be. I don't know how God wants to use you. But it's going to be more than just adjusting my course once our eyes are on him and we're no longer focused on our performance and we're no longer focused on how well we're trying to achieve this relationship with God, once we're no longer focused on that, we're focused on him, he's going to be growing us. He's going to be shifting and adjusting us. And he's going to be, hey, do you see that? Do you see that? And if we're really listening, we're going to be like, oh, oh, yeah, what do you want me to do about it? And it could be something as simple as you walk in to the gas station which I know many of us pay by credit card anymore. But, you know, if you walk in, maybe you need coffee or whatever. But you walk in, and there's somebody standing there at the register, and you walk past them, and God's like, did you see them? And you're going, yeah, yeah, I just want a Slim Jim. You're like, just let me, you know. And, and he's like, did you see them? If we're really listening, we're going, okay. 
what? And it may be something as simple as walking over and be like, hey, man, I love your shirt. That's pretty awesome. Or I love your ink. Like, tell me the story. Why'd you, why'd you get that tattoo? Like, what? It, it may be something simple like that, but that simple engagement may change their life. There may be somebody that's in your life, at work or school or in your family or whatever, and, and God's like, do you see where they are in their journey right now? Would you be willing to walk with them? Could be somebody at the gym. Could be somebody you play sports with. Could be anybody. And God's like, do you, do you see that? You guys have been talking about some life stuff. Is there a, is there a journey you could walk on with them? Because I want to share wisdom. I want to get them out of the wadi. It could be simple like that. It could be more focused and more specific, like the journey we went on with our daughter in March. And she would say repeatedly for years, you guys hear the voice of God, not me. I don't hear God. And God set up a series of circumstances where, where I, was, I was away and God put on my heart to text her something. And I texted it to her. And it was, I got kind of the like, okay. <laughs> like, Glad you're having a moment, Dad. <laughs> that was kind of the response. Like, I love you too. You know, it was very much like the person standing in the water going, what water? But that circumstance set up a week later for her to be on a journey where God, she experienced God in a way she never has before. Now it's up to her if she wants to listen. It's up to her if she's willing to continue to lean in and hear that wisdom and make the decision she's making in the wadi or up on the rock. Or it could be as dramatic as this. Robin Dykstra spoke at a women's retreat a few weeks ago, and she shared this story before. I, I hope I do it justice. I, I, I don't have all of the details right because it wasn't my story. Um, but Robin Dykstra is a former Playboy bunny, um, and she shares the journey of, of like how her life was just all, like how it was broken, how she came to the Lord. And when she began to walk with the Lord, she began to realize that God was, God was leading her in things and saying things to her and, and leading her to understanding. And one of the stories she shares is she was, I don't remember where she was going, but she was driving. And the Lord, the Lord said to her, you need to go in that gas station and you need to stand on your head in front of the soda case. And she's like, what? Go in the gas station, stand on your head in front of the soda case. Now, I don't know what was going through her head at that moment. I can tell you what would be going through my head. Are you kidding? Like, really? Really, you want me to, you want me to do what? Like, I'm not liking this. I want to be obedient, but I'm not, I'm not liking this. Well, her heart was to be obedient, so she's like, all right, I have no idea why you're calling me to do this. And she walks in, she goes over the soda case, and she does a, headstand, a handstand, headstand in front of the soda case. And I don't know if she looked around. I know I would have been like, did anybody see that? Like, done. Okay, you good? You know, that would have been my approach. But I don't know how she did it, but she did it. And as she started to walk out, the attendant at the counter said to her, um, what was that about? And she's like, I, I, I believe in God, and you know, I, I believe that he, he leads us and, and, and speaks to us. And she goes, and I was driving by, and I felt like God said I needed to come in and do that. I don't understand it. I don't know why I did it. I, frankly, I'm quite, you know, I'm, I'm sort of embarrassed, but, you know, this is, I'm just being obedient because, you know, if, if God said it to do it, it's important. And the attendant, she went to walk out, and the attendant said, can you, can you wait a minute? She was like, okay. And he took a gun from out from under the counter, and he put it up, and he said, I had committed myself to ending my life when I was done working tonight. And my prayer was, God, if you're real, have somebody come in here and stand on their hands in front of that soda case. And he goes, and here you are. 
What am I supposed to do with that? He goes, please tell me about this God that you believe in. That should wreck us. It should absolutely wreck us. That every single day, from his word, is wisdom and understanding that how we live will help people get out of a wadi. Not just help get us out of a wadi, but help people get out of a wadi. The man was ready to die. And if we're really listening and we learn how he speaks, it won't just be in his word, but aligned with his word. It'll never counter his word, but aligned with his word. His spirit will begin to lead us to do things in the lives of others that could change the destiny. It's not us, but it's us walking with him. And we should never overlook the smile that we give to somebody. We should never overlook the question that we ask someone about what they're wearing or how they look or how their day is going. We should never overlook that person who's getting our coffee or getting our lunch. We should never overlook that person who's cleaning the machines at the laundromat. We should never overlook those people that we encounter anywhere because at any moment, God may say, I need you to get them out of the wadi. The flood water's coming. We listen to the voice of God, not just for our own sakes. Not, not just because God loves us, because he does. But because he's also growing us to join him in his work so that he can love others and get others out of the wadi teaching them how to hear his voice, how to walk with him, and realize the full potential that he designed in them. Isn't it amazing God can do that? That as he's working with us and he's helping our mess become something that he sees that sometimes we're just like, I don't, I don't see it. I don't know how you could want that of me, but okay. But as he's working that out, he's also saying, yeah, 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 I'm getting this ready in you. And then through you, we're going to work together and we're going to do this over here with them and with them. That's how awesome God is. And Jesus says, all we have to do is hear it and put it into practice. Are you willing to do that today? That what you're hearing and what God is unveiling as you go on this journey, you begin to think about those critical adjustments and again, I just want to encourage you, don't think of, about it from the standpoint of, I have to X, Y, Z, fill in the blank. Look at the adjustment. I'm in a wadi. I need to be up there. God, show me the path. It starts with a willingness to say, I'm willing to not be in a wadi. Not I got to figure it out. Not I don't know how, so I'm just going to do what I do. God, I'm willing to not be in a wadi. Help me walk out. And he will absolutely grow you in that direction. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the simple pictures, the simple pictures that make so much sense to us. We do not know the terrain we walk. As familiar as it may be, we never know what each day will bring. And we don't want to walk in fear of what we don't know. We want to walk with courage in what you're showing us. With confidence that even if we are to face our end today, we know it's in your hands and not a result of not listening to you. And for as long as we're here, God, that the choices we make, the decisions we, we, the paths we walk down, we're walking with your wisdom and your understanding. And we're seeing the things come about that you have promised. God, would you reveal our potential? Help us 
to realize our potential as we listen to you and help us, God, as, we, as you grow us and as we walk with you in this. As we learn to do that with you, God, use us to walk with others and help them walk with you. That the full potential of who you've made us to be can not only be realized, but the glory and the amazing wonder of that will reflect back and be like, man, you are the most incredible artist. Let our lives be the song, the poem that you've written so that you are seen clearly and that truly all creation, including us, will declare your glory and walk in the wonder and the blessing of who you are. Thank you, Lord, for calling us to the fullness of this life. Jesus, help us to understand what that means on a daily basis through your word. And Holy Spirit, empower us to walk in that for our sake and the sake of others. We praise you and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.